Today is going to be the last chapter of Jeremiah 52. Uh, I'll just set up the opening before we get into it. Uh, everything in this chapter we should have already seen, so I'm just going to read through it once we get going here. 52 is an appendix that was added to the chapters of Jeremiah. No one is sure, so you can get into that argument and track that down, who did add this appendix. Like we know at the time of the writing of Jeremiah, someone came along not too long after, added the appendix, uh, because we know a lot of the documents were kept by Baruch, they were uh, disseminated, they were collected, and they were sealed together, so we found them all together. But someone added an appendix that was not Baruch. Uh, the theory that people held for a long time was that it was Ezra. Uh, I don't really know, I don't really care. Basically what it is, is someone went in and they added information and sort of summarized some of the events and then they quote a little bit out of Kings. And it's sort of like someone added like a more concise narrative of what historical events happened. So that's what it is. So we'll get into that. And then when we're done, just so you know where we're headed with this, we're gonna talk about a couple ways, um, the we, things we can learn from Jeremiah. But before we get into any of that, uh, right after we pray, I'm also going to talk about ways that Jesus and Jeremiah experiences they shared, and there's more than 15, because the list I'm checking has 14, but I know there's more because I thought of at least one off the top of my head they didn't have. So let's pray and we'll get into it. Uh, but hopefully we have a really good, uh, productive time. Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through your word, that you would help us to have a heart of a servant, a heart of someone who cares, that you would be with us, Lord, even as we uh, strive to be like you. And we strive to be like your followers, Lord. I pray this be a special time for us together. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So before we get going, uh, I said at the start, Jeremiah was considered one of the most godly men in the Old Testament. I thought it would be interesting if we just went through some of the parallels that happened in both Jeremiah and Jesus' life, just for fun. Uh, right off the bat, Jeremiah 1 and Luke 1 start showing that both were known before they were conceived. So we have that weird event. It doesn't happen very often. It happens to Jesus. It happens to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1 and Luke 1 again. Both are called from the womb. Jeremiah 1 Luke 2. Both knew the Father's call before they reached adulthood. Jeremiah 13 Luke 19. Both of them are weeping over Jerusalem over its judgment. It happens to both of them. Jeremiah 29, John 10, both are accused of being mad. They're accused of being insane. Jeremiah 29, John 8, both of them are accused of self-promoting. Jeremiah 20 and Luke 18, Matthew 27, Luke 22, both of them get made fun of and are mocked by the authorities. Jeremiah 20, Luke 11, both of them have what they have said to be scrutinized and used against them. Jeremiah 26, Matthew 26, both are called worthy of death by corrupt priests, so people want to kill them. Jeremiah 18, John 11, there's actual death plots. Jesus has like three different plots against his life, if I remember correctly. Jeremiah has a couple. Jeremiah 18, John 11, oh, just did that one, sorry. Jeremiah 19, Luke 21, both of them prophesy about the fall of Jerusalem and have those prophecies come true. Jeremiah 8, Matthew 21, Jeremiah uses the no figs on the tree as a sign of loss. Jesus does the same thing. He actually fulfills the sign of Jeremiah and curses the tree. That's a quote right to Jeremiah 8. Everybody, that's just a fun one as an aside. I've heard atheists before be like, why was Jesus just really mad about this tree? He's literally mad about Israel, and it's a reference to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, Luke 5, both of them uh, prophesied a disappearance of the bridegroom. Jeremiah 11 and Isaiah 53 were led like a lamb to the slaughter. And then one more that uh, this list didn't have that I thought was fun. Both of them were taken to Egypt with other people. Both of them had to flee to Egypt or were taken there. So there's many uh, comparisons. And that's before we get into the temperament and the actions, which we'll get into. That's just life circumstances, uh, which is very odd that there's so many similar parallels. But we're going to see more uh, once we talk about it in a little bit. So here we are, we're in this appendix. Uh, people think that this appendix was kind of added to track the prophecies of God. Uh, it would make sense to me that it'd be added because if I was in a time where there's so many false prophets and heresies, and I came along and I had something that had what was going on in it truthfully, I might want to add a little bit of an end section. And historians do this today. We usually just do it at the beginning. Uh, there was a time when appendixes were always at the back, but usually it's like a forward almost, sort of summarizing, but let's get straight into it. 
It starts with Zedekiah, chapter 52. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamotal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, different Jeremiah. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jeho Jehoiakim had done. Because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point that Jerusalem and Judah, he cast them out of his presence. So Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon, and in the ninth year of his reign, the tenth month, the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with his army against Jerusalem, laid siege to it. They built siege works all around it. The city was besieged till the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, so a couple of year siege. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city, there was no food for the people of the land. A breach was made in the city, the men of war fled and went out of the city by night, by way of the gate, between the two walls, by the king's garden and the Chaldeans were around the city. They went in the direction of Araba, and the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. His army was scattered from him. They captured the king, brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, in the land of Hamath. They passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, slaughtered all the officials of Judah at Riblah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him in chains. The king of Babylon took him to Babylon, put him in prison until the day of his death. So again, the whole rest of this, it's going to go just like that. It's sort of like a news brief almost. This is just saying, this is what happened. Now we get into the temple being burned, so we're skipping ahead a little bit in time. In the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, it was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the bodyguard, who served the king of Babylon, he entered Jerusalem. He burned down the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house was burned down, and all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, was carried away captive, some of the poorest of the people, and left the people who were left in the city, and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the artisans. Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. And then the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord that stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke it into pieces, carried the, piece, the bronze to Babylon. They took away all the pots, the shovels, the snuffers, the basin, the dishes for incense, all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service. They took the small bowls and the fire pans and the basins and the pots and the lampstands and the dishes for incense and bowls for drink offerings. I always thought that was interesting because they're talking about bronze. If we remember earlier in history, they raid Jerusalem and they take the gold from Solomon and, and I imagine, historically, you're thinking, well, it couldn't be any worse than that. And yes, they took the gold. Now they come back, they only leave you with the bronze. And I think there's a lot, you can think about that, but there's a lot to be said when the New Testament talks about if you insist on fighting someone over court instead of doing, paying what you're owed, they'll come back for every penny, every red penny. And I'm getting that image here. They, they shouldn't have rebelled. They broke their word. They did rebel. And so whatever gold and silver was left, but they even came for the bronze. And that just amused me as I was studying this. What was of gold the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver as silver? As for the two pillars, the one sea, the twelve bronze bowls that were under the sea, the stands, which Solomon the king had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these things was beyond weight. So they didn't even measure it, they just, it was so heavy they just carried it off. As for the pillars, the height of the one pillar was 18 cubits, its circumference was 12 cubits, its thickness was four fingers, and it was hollow. It was a capital of bronze. The height of the one capital was five cubits. A network of pomegranates, all of bronze, were around the capital. The second pillar had the same with pomegranates. There were 96 pomegranates on one side. All the pomegranates were 100 in the network around. So they're adorned. They have a lot going on. They're big. Uh, they broke it all into pieces. That's the, the whole thing is just saying that they broke all of this incredible amount. Uh, what's fun is, this is just a brief intercession, we know historically and non-historically, and we're going to mention later a little historical thing that backs this up, which I find to be neat, uh, is that all of those vessels, other than the pillars, get returned by Cyrus. Cyrus is so impressed with Daniel and the prophecy of Jeremiah, uh, or Isaiah, I should say, he gives them the vessel articles, and they're able to take them back, which is kind of a big deal in history. Uh, the people exiled the Babylon. The captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, the three keepers of the threshold, and from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war, the seven men of the king's council, who they found in the city, the secretary of the commander of the army, who mustered the people of the land, 
and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down, and he put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. This is the number of the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the seventh year, 3,023 Judeans. In the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. In the twenty-third year, Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the Judeans 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600. People debate the amount of exiles, but there was three exiles. This is only mentioning one. So don't say that this was all the amount of people taken. That was literally only one group out of three deportations. Uh, continuing, we're almost done with the chapter, Jehoiachin. In the 37th year of exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, the 12th month and the 25th day of the month, evil Merodach, which spot on for naming, but evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began, graciously freed Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he died regularly at the king's table, for his allowance, a regular allowance, was given to him by the king, according to his daily needs, until the day of his death, as long as he lived. So a really fun thing happened here. Uh, in between Nebuchadnezzar and the next guy, Balshazar, who's going to overthrow everything, there's another king. Uh, people think he might have been reigning during Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. No one knows. But what he did was he embezzled. He did bad things with the money. And they threw him in prison. And we know all of this from cuneiform. They threw him in prison. And while he was in prison, he meets this blind, exiled king in prison, Zedekiah. Or, uh, sorry, uh, Jehoiachin. And when he's restored to power, he basically gives a sort of pardon. You can't let the king that you've taken into captive go because he's a rebel king. But because he's friends with him, he remembers him and feeds him. And we, in the cuneiform, we have a recording of his diet. So the diet, it says there that he ate till the day of his death. They recorded the food he ate on this cuneiform tablet telling this story. So we have like his lunch and like his dinner, which I just thought was really interesting. It amazes me the amount of times people need they, they really want things like that to prove that scripture is true, and it's never enough, because every day we literally unearth more and more and more and more that validates the scriptural story. Uh, in Daniel, I talked about finding the, we, we have found the furnaces they used to make the bricks. People for a long time said there was no way they could have furnaces that big. We found them. We found the bricks. We found the laws on them that said, we'll throw you in here if you blaspheme against our gods. Uh, we just keep finding more and more and more. That one literally mentions the cuneiform, his restoration and diet, which is just a really weird little thing. The British Museum is full of wonderful uh, scriptural things. So, okay, that's done. We've wrapped up Jeremiah. Before we go into Lamentation, let's remember that Jeremiah is, he is someone whose heart is genuinely torn for his people. He suffers deeply for his people. And what's awesome about him is that he reminds me of David in a certain way. David is considered a man after God's own heart, not because David doesn't do anything evil. He absolutely does, and God punishes him harshly for it. But David, when he's confronted by his sin, stops, does not make excuses, repents, and actually changes. Those are the things that David does, at least twice. He stops, doesn't make excuses, repents, doesn't do it again. He genuinely, in repentance, to be sincere, we know you don't keep doing it. Jeremiah is a similar way. It wasn't sin he's repenting over, though. What he's doing is he has these doubts. And he even has doubts to the point where he's like, man, I don't know if I can do this. I feel inadequate. And we saw that early in Jeremiah. And God literally stops him. And Jeremiah, once he's answered by God, that's enough. So that's the first thing we learned from Jeremiah. He has these incredible doubts. He has this incredible pain. He knows that he's ministering to the potential death of his people. He knows that later it will be the death of his people. He feels inadequate, and he doesn't live there. He doesn't live there. A lot of Christians have a defeatist attitude, and that's where they'd stop. They would, they would be so inadequate and so lacking in confidence that God would give them reassurance, and they don't remember it. It, it almost reminds me like they're looking in their mirror, and they forget what they look like, as scripture says. 
But it's like with encouragement. Like Jesus and Christ and the Spirit give you encouragement. They give you power. And instead, you want to take the comfort in wailing and being depressed and downtrodden and inadequate. Jeremiah does not do that. What's interesting is that even though he's suffering deeply, and we'll see that in Lamentation, he still suffers the whole time of his ministry. He still feels the pain, but he doesn't let that stop him from serving God. That's the difference. Obviously, like I mentioned, his message is not fun. He oversees the death of his people. And what's interesting is that the, all the times we go through God and Jeremiah in this chapter, in this uh, book, it's always, here's the outcome, here's what's going to happen, here's hope. Every single time, God rails, he goes into detail, he's very upset, here's hope, wrapping it up in the end. The thing that Jeremiah is weeping over is that no one will cling to that hope. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's where he goes. He weeps over sin. He's despised by his own people. They try to kill him. They want to kill him. He outlives three different dynasties, maybe five, depending on how you count it. And they, they are all despising of his message. And another lesson we learn is that intercessory prayer, praying for another person, might not work. Might not work. And we see this in Jeremiah. He prays ardently for his people. The moral thing that Jeremiah is doing is he doesn't stop asking God to intercede, and he doesn't stop praying that the people would listen. That doesn't mean that it was a waste of his time. We have a moral duty to care about someone enough to actually pray and intercede on their behalf. That's a very important thing. We run into people who have abandoned their entire faith because they go, well, you know what? I prayed. I did the magic lottery machine of God, and the intercessory prayer didn't work. The person didn't change. So I'm just done. I walk away. Jeremiah continues until the very last day to pray for his people. The very last day, he's praying for these people. It would have been really easy for him to get bitter, upset, and to say, I'm done with these people. He never gets to that point. Even when he rebukes them in Egypt, he gives them hope. The next thing we see is that God is personally hurt by our sins. Personally hurt by our sins. And the thing that a lot of people miss is that we are sick in our sin. We really are. Scripture says that Christ is the physician. He comes to heal the sick. But we are sick in our sin, and we're so sick in our sin that we want to spread our sin and our pain and our hurt. Because we're hurt, and hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. Let me say that again. That's a, that's a truth you'll find when you're working with uh, damaged individuals. Hurt people hurt people. And we have these sick people where that sickness has hurt us on a personal level. The same way it hurts God, it hurts us. And where people miss the boat, this is where they miss the ticket. They go, well, I'm going to be condemned, or God's going to condemn me because, insert X, because I did that bad thing. Because I just simply didn't want to acknowledge this. Because of this, that, and the other thing. The way scripture actually says our condemnation, this is it. And we see this in Jeremiah. God is always begging the people to have relationship with him. All the time. At one point, he throws out his entire system of law. He goes, dude, just try to seek me. We'll, we'll work it out. We'll make it okay. He's willing to do so much, even death on a cross, to take care of that sickness. Our condemnation comes from denying that relationship. That's it. And the, the fun thing about it is that people, we want to be a victim a lot. We absolutely do. In one regard, we are a victim of sin. We didn't ask to have a sinful nature, but we do. In the other regard, we're also a perpetrator of sin. And that's what people don't connect the two dots. We stop right there and we go, you know, I'm a victim. It's unjust of God to punish me. Whereas from God's perspective, he's made it the easiest he can possibly make it. He's literally extending a hand, we call it pervenient grace, asking you just to take it. That's all you have to do. And God throughout all of Jeremiah is begging for that relational impact. He's begging for it. Over and over and over. And again, Something we learned at BBS. Sometimes God is very loud trying to get your attention, and sometimes he's really quiet. And we went over that with BBS, but we see that in Jeremiah. Sometimes Jeremiah is standing in the marketplace where everyone has to listen to him, and sometimes it's that really, really quiet voice that God sends. Next thing we learn, Jeremiah gives a promise of God with us. The fulfillment of that promise is Emmanuel, is Jesus Christ. 
Jeremiah gives a promise that anyone who seeks God, God would save. Anyone. And it starts in God's house, in this case Israel, and it goes outwards. Jesus starts his ministry where? God's people, and then he extends it to the Gentile. There's just another echo between Jeremiah and Jesus. What I'm saying is that Jeremiah has a deep, deep richness when confronted with not only sin, but judgment of sin. If as Christians we could care as much as Jeremiah, it would be amazing. It'd be amazing. And the thing that astounds me of Jeremiah is that there's a saying that goes around, it's really popular, and it sounds really pithy, but they say the opposite of love is indifference. Scripturally, the opposite of love is fear. It's fear. And Jeremiah is the man who goes out despite his fear, despite the death of the penalty, despite the same guys that hunted down and murdered other prophets. And he doesn't let that fear creep into his heart, and he doesn't let that fear turn into bitterness. If we as Christians can do that, what could we do with our community around us? I want to think about that. What could we do? If we could be sincere and uphold the consequence, because you have this dynamic here. You have a dynamic of the good legalistic person who is going to beat you over the head with the law, which God says, I'm literally willing to throw all of that away for a relationship in Jeremiah. And then you have the person who's so winsome, they're not any good. <coughs> they are so accepting of everything, they're literally not any good. Jeremiah would have us be right in the middle. One more way than Nazarenes, we need to stay the people in the middle. Because both of those groups exist. We don't want to be on either extreme. We used to be over here with those legalists a lot more. We can't slip and slide too far. Jeremiah would go on and he would write lamentations where he would weep and he would moan. I told you that was going to be short. I'm almost done. And so before we get into Lamentations, I just want to talk a little bit about it. Next week we'll start Lamentations. It'll probably be two, maybe three sections. I could be wrong. It could go a little longer, but I don't expect it will. Uh, but I just want to talk a little bit about the sections of Lamentations. Because Lamentations has... Before, I don't want to get too deep into it tonight, because this is not all Lamentations. But what Lamentations is set up for in Hebrew is very weird, and I just want to preface that. 1, 2, and 4 of Lamentations in Hebrew are acrostic, meaning that the verses start with an A, a B, a C, a D, all the way down. The whole chapter of 1, 2, and 4 are acrostic in Hebrew. No one knows why. No one knows why, it just is. Uh, they are also arranged almost like they're supposed to be set to music which I find very interesting. Uh, was Jeremiah potentially doing like David in the Psalms and singing his lamentations to God? Maybe so. Maybe so. Chapter 3 is a full confession of sin. What's interesting about chapter 3 is there's 66 verses. 66 verses is used, 66 is used, or 6, is usually used as a sign of sin and a sign of man because it's incomplete. Uh, that's why 6 gets used as that. Because seven is the number of completion, it's the number of divinity. So in scripture, if you believe in that kind of thing, you'll see six or six, 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 or sixty-six referring to uncomplete sin. Because what makes us complete? That one element of God, Jesus Christ. So chapter three is a full confession of sin. They are acrostic, but it's every three verses are acrostic in chapter three in Hebrew. Every three verses. It's very strange. Uh, Psalm 119 has an identical structure. That's why I say it's almost reminding me of David and Psalms. Chapter 5 has 1, 2, and 4, like 1, 2, and 4. Chapter 5 is 22 verses, but chapter 5 is the only one that's not acrostic. So it has the same amount of verses that 1, 2, and 4 have, because they all have 22 verses, but they're not acrostic. So anyway, just wanted to mention that we're going to be getting into it. Uh, I'm not singing it for you. I'm not doing it. And I'm not doing it in Hebrew so you can find the acrostic. I just thought that was really weird structure looking at it. I'm not singing it and I'm not doing it in Hebrew. You can do that on your own. Find someone else. There you go. But those are, that's going to be Lamentations. We are going to get into a little bit deeper as we know. Now we know the whole story of Jeremiah. We know his life. We know his message. We're going to see how deeply riven he was about his people. Uh, and that's really going to be the fulfillment of Jeremiah. And I believe this is rewarding 
because there's so many ways that Jesus and Jeremiah are very similar. Life experience, their message, and how they treat people is very, very similar. Uh, right down to even Jesus, and this is another similarity not on the list, Jesus only really mocks and name calls one group of people, and it's the corrupt priests. Jeremiah is similar. That's the only people we ever see him actually talk down to is the false prophets. Uh, every other person they meet, they meet with grace. So there's a lot of similarities. Next week we'll get into lamentation. I'll probably have to reclaim the extra half hour because you know, letting you guys out early because we're, we're done now. We're done with Jeremiah now. Well, we're going to be in the mountains, so you're going to have to do it up there on Friday before you go home. At, no, Friday's probably when I'm going to make it, so. <laughs> uh, you're not coming down for Sunday? Well, for those of you that are in town, there might only be three of us. And whoever's online, I don't know. I don't pay attention to that all the time. I should. This, uh, yeah, so leave your notes with me, and I'll do your half up there. Yeah, my half of, of lamentations up there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's it. We are done. So I'm going to end with a word of prayer. We have uh, needs in the church that I'll be lifting up as well uh, from this morning. So for those of you who are not here this morning, uh, see what we pray about and, and pray about that too. Every prayer be welcome. Uh, Lord, we come before you and we want to lift up Scotland. Uh, we don't know his exact details, circumstances, diagnosis, Lord, but we pray that uh, the troubled spirit that he has right now, Lord, whatever it looks like, uh, physical, mental, whatever affliction, Lord, that you would be with him, that you would provide some kind of way forward. Uh, Father, whatever help that looks like, uh, from the help of experts, from the help of self-understanding, from the help of medication, Father, we just pray that your hand and guidance would be on this whole process. And, uh, Lord, lead him into peace as he's in this turbulent time and he's figuring out who he is. Uh, Father, I just pray for uh, my mother's friends, Lord, that you would be with her and uh, provide all kinds of healing, Father. Uh, we give thanks for Alina and for her surgery that went well. The tumor was not malignant, Lord. We thank you for that. Lord, we lift up our church. We pray that we would be a people who love whoever you send in our door, that our heart would break over what breaks their heart, what breaks your heart, Father, that we would be faithful in prayer, faithful in ministry, faithful to the message you've given us. Because, Lord, we need to understand the judgment so we can understand hope. So, Father, I pray that we would just keep that in mind, that we would be fearless. And even if we have doubts, Lord, that once you answer our doubts, we would have the faith and courage to trust what you tell us. Father, forgive us now if we have sins we need to pray and confess over, Lord. I pray that you would be with us, you would guide us. Not that we would sin, Lord, but that if we do, that if we do, you would be just and faithful to forgive us. Lord, we pray as we go into this godly week and this godly world that you would let us be a light for you. Praise things in Jesus' name.